Oh, wait a minute. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so my presentation is on strokes and felines, and a lot of what I'm going to say is the same in dogs, too. Um, but the reason I wanted to do this is because this past summer, my cat actually had two strokes, um, and unfortunately, he passed away from the second one, but he was 21 years old and he had a good life. Um, uh, but I'm just going to talk about the experiences I had with him and also um, what I researched afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's a stroke? Um, it's a loss of blood flow to parts of the brain resulting in neuro neurologic abnormalities. Um, so there's five pairs of arteries supplying the brain, three su supplying the cerebral portion, and two supplying the cerebellum. And then there's ischemic strokes and then hemorrhagic strokes. Um, this photo right here, this is of a greyhound brain, and you can tell right here this highlighted portion, and right here that's um, the damage that stroke did. Um, and it's in the dorsal cerebellum part of the brain. Okay, so ischemic strokes are a lot more common in both animals and humans. Um, and then the cause is a local blockage of a blood vessel or a vascular obstruction transported to the brain from a distant site. Um, and I thought it was interesting that 50% of animals, um, the cause of the stroke is undetermined. And it's referred to as a cryptogenic ischemic stroke. And that's what happened with my cat Bean. We never really determined the um, reason for sure that he had a stroke. Um, so after it occurs, the animal has what is called an infarct and an penumbra area. So the infarct, what that is, it's a localized area of dead tissue resulting from failure of blood supply, and it can result in necrosis of neurons. So there's the infarcting area, and it's labeled that when there's a blood loss of about 10 to 25 percent. Okay, before you go on, I, I love that term cryptogenic. I, you don't see that very often, but crypto means hidden. Mm -hmm. So it's a hidden cause. <clears throat> Good. And then there's the penumbra area, and that lies between the area of infarction and then the normal tissue. So normal tissue out here and right here. Um, and this area survives or can survive because of collateral arteries that are trying to keep it supplied um, with blood. And this is usually the area that veterinari veterinarians can hopefully target um, pharmacologically. They can hopefully treat that area. Um, the infarction area can be treated as well, but that's pretty rare um, because um, no matter what, the neurons are going to be killed. But I think you can rescue some of the glial cells that are right there. Okay, and then the hemorrhagic stroke, um, this one is more rare, but there's more deaths that occur with it. Um, the cause is bleeding <coughs> of blood vessels in the brain uh, into the brain parenchyma or the subarachnoid space. Substantial bleeding can be fatal as the blood spills around the brain and cre can create the swelling and the pressure and definitely damage the cells and tissues in the brain. And the reasons for this bleeding aren't completely understood, but most think it's uh, more likely when the animal has high blood pressure, aged blood vessels, strokes are more likely in older pets, but although they can have them at about any age. And then AVM, arter arteriovenous malformation. Okay, and then other underlying diseases that can cause strokes, um, some that stick out are kidney disease and diabetes, cancer, um, and then high doses of steroids, such as prednisone. And then it's important to note that no breed is more prone to strokes than another, although if a breed is more prone to, say, like kidney disease, then you should be on the lookout for strokes as well. Um, this part's difficult because uh, <coughs> cats are notorious for hiding their pain or just hiding in general when something's wrong. Um, but in hindsight, what my sister actually noticed was uh, my cat Bean that morning, what, when she was petting him, he would kind of push his head against her abnormally and then push his head on the furniture um, more than usual. It was definitely not normal. Um, and other things you can look for is they're not using their legs normally, a head tilt, abnormal eye movements, and then um, any abnormal behavior is kind of broad, but sometimes the most specific weird things are what are the key to diagnosing something. So, so you're saying that's before the stroke? Mm -hmm. Yep. He was. I'll show you a, a video afterwards of uh, after the stroke, but before the stroke, that was something that we noticed. Okay. So they even there's a, there's kind of a warning that you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're definitely more subtle, but. Okay. Okay, so signs of stroke occur. Um, this is what I observed from my cat. These pictures aren't my cat, but um, I saw stiff joints um, after the stroke occurred. The paws were folded under, mismatched pupils. It definitely was not that distinct at all. 
um, but I could tell that they weren't the same. Um, there was fluttering of one of his ears for some reason. When I pet him, his left ear would keep fluttering and that wasn't normal for him. And then there was uh, weakness and unsteadiness. And other signs are altered mental status, circling, head tilt, seizures, and coma. Okay, so this is him. This was probably seven hours or maybe a little bit less. Um, we came home from somewhere and my mom found him like this. So um, his, the left side of his body, both limbs were folded under. He couldn't seem to flip them forward. Um, and that means that the right side of his brain was what the stroke affected because it always, the right side controls the sensory and <laughs> muscles of the left side. And then this picture I just thought was sweet because this is my other cat and she just wouldn't leave him alone. <laughs> Afterwards, she was his moral support. That's neat that you had the uh, mindset to take a video. Mm -hmm. You know, usually when you have something wrong with your animal, you're so focused on yeah. doing something for the animal that the last thing you think about is, oh man, I should have made a little video of that. So yeah, and I immediately sent it to my veterinarian that yeah. I for, yeah. so. Yeah, and that's neat because <coughs> I, I do this with my vet. If I, something happens, like when the puppies were, what was it, oh, I don't know. You know, I got them from a farm and they had uh, tapeworm. But you know, a tapeworm, it dries up pretty fast. So even if you take a fecal sample in, I mean, they can find the tapeworm, but it's not like it's living now. And so I took a little video when I saw it, you know, just when I brought them off the farm, they had fleas, and if they have fleas, they have tapeworms, right? Anyway, so I had this little video, so I showed Brittany when I went to her. I go, look at this. She goes, oh yeah, that's a tapeworm. <laughs> it's amazing, the little segment, and they're like, they're crawling on the feces, and it's, it's you know, but it would have been too late. I mean, it would have been too late to take the fecal sample in, but you wouldn't have seen that beautiful, like, little movement of the tapeworm. Yeah. So, yeah, that be, let that be a lesson to you. If you ever, with our phones now, you know, we always have, like, a camera with us. And if something goes wrong or weird with your dog or something's in its feces or it throws up, take a little movie or a picture of it, because that can very, be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after the stroke, um, the symptoms are usually worse, uh, oh, they don't usually get worse after the 24, uh, first 24 hours, uh, unless there was a ruptured blood vessel. And when you bring your animal to the vet, they'll look at the health history, ask for a description of symptoms, perform um, examinations, and may do blood tests, urinalysis, or fecal exams. And then um, if you really want a definite answer, um, you can, well, a CT was uh, the first method used, but now the gold standard is MRIs. And then treatment. Um, so the problem with the treatment, there's not concrete evidence that any medication improves the clinical outcome in pa patients, even if they're rushed to a hospital. Um, the only clot busting treatment um, called thrombolysis, um, which work, it works by dissolving um, the clot and allowing the blood flow to return. And that's um, the only thing that's been pretty successful, but for even this, the patient must be suitable for the treatment first and then also be seen within three hours of the stroke, which is pretty difficult to, you know, rush your animal to the veterinarian for that. Um, and then something else you can do afterwards is oxygen therapy, improves oxygen delivery to damaged brain tissue, and um, also in the meantime, in the meanwhile, the body will hopefully reestablish blood flow and the swelling should go down. Uh, medications that can help with this um, are mannitol, uh, which treats intracranial pressure by reducing blood viscosity, steroids, and then hypertonic saline, which does rapid restoration of blood volume and pressure. Yeah, let me make a little comment on mannitol. I think every time they do brain surgery in people, they give the person, now don't quote me for 100%, they give the person mannitol because it tends to shrink the brain a little bit. Okay, and then other treatment options, um, you definitely want to manage the underlying conditions because say they have kidney disease, or something else, um, controlling that can help prevent future strokes. Um, and then just keep them comfortable, uh, maintain hydration. I put all of Beam's things in one area so he didn't have to move very far if he didn't want to. Uh, and then help them with urination, defecation, cleanliness and comfort, uh, physical therapy, and keep an eye out for more symptoms. I had to help Bean in and out of like, the litter box the first day, and he actually would not 
defecate the first day either unless I got him in like perfect position. Mm -hmm. uh, but after that, he got better mm -hmm. after the first day. <coughs> and so that's a few days after he's he's able to flip those paws forward. He's interested in food and water, so that was good. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then recovery. Uh, cats generally look their worst at, um, in the first 24 hours after the stroke. Recovery is possible, um, but it's more possible when the animal has less severe symptoms and less underlying diseases. Um, okay, yeah, so this is again a few days after. And so the damage to the brain most likely was not too bad since he was able to recover like this um, after the first stroke. After the second stroke, he lost function in all of his limbs, and they were very stiff. And, and how far were they apart, the strokes? Um, I think like 17 days. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he recovered this time, and then he <coughs> impressed us. This was a few days later. He just kind of went for this. Now, is this before the second stroke? Y yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Able to jump up on the bed and mm -hmm. walk around the rest of the house, so... And that is it. And so then he had his second stroke, mm -hmm. and then did he die that day? Or? He didn't die that day. We waited a little bit to you know see if he was going to recover. Right. The same, but this time you know I think it was just his right paw so was moving just a little bit. Okay. Um, he was still like consciously there, mm -hmm. but it, it, was, it was different, and um, he was fully incontinent. And you could tell. He mm -hmm. just, you know, yeah, and it happening. was the end. So. Yeah. Did you have to euthanize him, or did he die? Mm -hmm. You took no, him we, in. We had to yeah. Him. yeah, that's always tough. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah. Okay, questions. That was very good. Strokes. Wow. Yeah. Because so I think when they're doing the MRI, they can more be more definite. It was a stroke, mm -hmm. and they can see the area of the infarction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Comments? <laughs> questions? Let's give Alexis a round of applause.